Good morning, Central Baptist Church. Stand, if you would, let's sing Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. The sun may dwell where these are found. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright but still i pray to heaven i found lord lead me on to higher ground lord lift me up and let me stand thy faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than i have found lord plant my feet on high Good morning. Uh, it's, that's a little bit better. Y'all were a somber bunch next week, I, or last week. And so uh, glad to see that y'all have cheered up a little bit since last week. A uh, few announcements uh, for y'all this morning. I've been asked to remind everybody that tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in the Church Fellowship Hall, uh, Limestone Medical Center will be here providing flu vaccines. Uh, also next Sunday, uh, immediately following church, there will be a potluck lunch. Y'all be sure to stay for that. Uh, all the youth Sunday school class will be hosting uh, that. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Deanna. Good morning. I have several announcements this morning, so I'll be quick. Uh, fall festival. Uh, our fall festival will be held on Wednesday, October the 26th, and we need your help with that. Uh, there's going to be several things we'll need between now and, and then, but one of the things is we need lots of individually wrapped candy that we will use for prizes for all the games at the fall festival. And there is a box in the, fellow, or in the foyer now. If you can uh, next time you're out shopping, just grab a bag of Halloween candy and put it out there for us, and we'll use those for prizes. Also, the Operation Christmas Child boxes. We do have boxes if you want to take a box to do individually with you or your family, your kids, grandkids, whatever. We do have about 50 boxes available for that. Then I have 100 boxes that we're going to be packing during our packing party uh, in November. But uh, if you would like to sponsor the items for a box for our packing party, you can do that with a donation of $25. Uh, just uh, make out your donation and on your envelope put OCC, Operations Christmas Child, and that way Tanya will know that that money's designated for that. And I'll be going and using that money to buy the items that we will need for our packing party. Um, our ladies' shopping trip is this Tuesday. Anyone who would like to go shopping with us, meet us here at 9 o'clock, and we will load up. And I think we're headed to either Temple or Bryan. We'll, we'll decide Tuesday morning, but we're going somewhere Tuesday morning. Also, our ladies' overnight shopping trip. Once a year, we go to, on an overnight trip. We're going to do that on November 7th and 8th. We're going to be going back down to the Woodlands Mall uh, and the Conroe area, and there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer if you would like to go with us on the overnight trip. Last thing is I have a save the date, something we're going to be doing in December. Uh, the Saturday, December the 3rd, we are going to be going to Bethlehem Revisited in Waxahachie. It is a walk-through Bethlehem experience. Uh, they take a several block area in the old part of downtown Waxahachie behind the Episcopal Church 
and they set up the village of Bethlehem. And it's really neat to walk through it. You'll see um, a candle shop, a soap shop, a temple, a, a blacksmith forge, just different things that, that would have been back in the original town of Bethlehem at the time Jesus was born. Uh, they'll also be um, back in the corner, a very neat little manger scene set up for us to walk through. My plan is that we will meet here around 3 o'clock. We'll eat dinner in Waxahachie, and then the Bethlehem Revisited starts around 6. Uh, so it'll be a full day. Anyone who would like to go is welcome, but this is a great opportunity for families to go on a trip together. We'll take all the church transportation we need and whatever cars we need to get everybody there. But I just wanted you to have that date. Uh, it'll be Saturday, December the 3rd. Thank you. Blessings in October. Our one-day mission trip is in two weeks on the 15th, but we're beginning to set up the work crews now. So if you're interested in participating, there's that sign-up sheet in the back, and we'll get them set up. Thank you. Are there any more announcements that we need to make mention of this morning? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all the ways that you love us, all the ways that you bless us, Lord. Father, I pray for this morning, Lord, that you would be exalted, that every song that we sing, every word that we say, Lord, every prayer that we pray, Lord, would be exalting you. Father, we just ask that you do this morning what we cannot. That's change hearts, change lives, change eternities today. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. There was Stan listening. He's able to deliver thee. <laughs> Tis the grandest theme through the ages run. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal song. Tis the grandest theme that the world their song. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able. My sin of cross, God in him for rest, our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or man, tis the grandest theme for a mortal strength. Tis the grandest theme, tell the world again, our God is able to deliver thee. able to deliver thee, though by sin or cross go to him for rest, our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest thing, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole, our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee, he is able to deliver thee, though my sin all press go to him for rest, our God is able to deliver thee. I stand amazed in the presence. Do you stand amazed when you think of what God did for you? You know, we, I, I look at myself sometimes, and I know y'all know this, but I know this too, that I'm such a mess, and that just I stand amazed that God would love someone like me. Amen. And I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How, how marvelous, how, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How, how marvelous, how, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sin and my sorrows, he made them his very Oh 
Well, I offered to sing a special this morning, but got turned down. So. <laughs> Good morning. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Isaiah. We're going to be spending most of our times in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37 this morning. We'll skip around a little bit. Um, we are continuing our series on prayer, a little mini two-week series last week. Uh, we started off and we answered the simple question of, does God hear us? Like, when we pray, does God hear us? And we looked at very clearly from Scripture that we have a Father in heaven, who when we cry out to Him, He hears us. And so today we're going to look at another question, but I want to frame it and start off like this. And I want to ask, uh, where are all my husbands at? If you're a husband in the room, raise your hand. All right, so we got years of experience in here. That's good, all right? I've got um, eight years of experience in marriage, kind of an expert, but um, I want to ask y'all, I want to ask and just see how you would have handled a situation that happened to me yesterday. Brittany's already shaking her head. Most, what y'all, a little background into the stuff, uh, there's so much of mine and Brittany's life that I'm just like, that's going to end up a sermon illustration, and y'all pray for her. She has to go through this on a, on a weekly basis. But yesterday, uh, we took the youth rock climbing, all right? And so we had a really good time. We rock climbed. It was fun. Uh, it was exhausting, but it was a good time. We got done rock climbing. We went rock climbing from about 9.30 to 11, and then at 11, we decided we were going to leave, and we were going to go eat lunch. Now, me and Brittany have had a really good, solid, peaceful marriage for the most part. And I say for the most part because most of our disagreements happen in the car when one of us is giving the other one directions. Does anybody else in here have those issues? Okay, all right, a few of y'all. Okay, all right. Uh, that, that's where we have most of our issues. Well, Yesterday, we, we, we left the rock climbing place, and we were looking, and the sign popped up, you know, one of those signs that says, at the next exit, you got this many places to eat. And so I asked the students, you know, where would you like to eat? Uh, and they need to repent because they didn't choose McDonald's, but the, the place that they chose for us to go to was Chick-fil-A, and which is awesome, love Chick-fil-A, God's chicken, you know, like, let's go, right? And we, we exited going towards Chick-fil-A. We missed our exit, or we missed our turn, nobody's fault, missed our turn, and, and kept going, and so we had to wait until we got to the next light, and Brittany had the GPS up, and when you miss an exit or miss a turn, the GPS reroutes, and so it presented with us a very simple path to get back, and she's like, you're going to take a right at the light, and you've got to go 2.6 miles, and you're going to take another right, and it should lead you back. And I'm like, that's kind of ridiculous. It was right there, right? Now we've got to go all this way. Well, we, we get up to the light, and there's a sign, and it's got Chick-fil-A on it pointing this way. Even though Brittany's GPS and she's guiding me is taking me that way. So husbands, we can even have the wives close their eyes if you'd like, but... I'm just curious, <laughs> Willie's already shaking his head at me, does anybody in here turn left? Well, okay, all right, okay, all right, some of y'all, uh, I'm, I'm hosting an open doghouse meeting from 5 to 8 today, you're welcome to come, but the path was this way, Brittany was guiding me this way. Uh, or the Chick-fil-A was this way, Brittany was guiding me this way. Uh, I actually turned this way, but then turned back around, which I, feels like even makes it worse. 
and then went to the Chick-fil-A that just made more sense over here. To which I got several remarks from, right? Uh, like, why are you even asking me to guide you if you're just going to do what you want anyways kind of thing? Uh, and so, y'all, we really do have a very happy marriage, and I am very blessed with a very gracious woman. But that thought that, that Brittany had, why would you even ask me if you're going to do what you want anyways, right? That's, a, that's an interesting thought. And when I began to prepare this sermon, that's kind of where I wanted to go. Um, and why, why I say it and why I frame it like that is because there's this concept in Scripture that when we start talking about prayer, almost seems to wage war uh, uh, against prayer. And it's this concept and idea in Scripture that's completely true. It's backed up by Scripture. I'm going to show you a few verses that God is sovereign. And what I simply mean by that is God is in complete control. That God is in control of everything. And I don't think anybody in here would argue that fact, that God is sovereign. He is in complete control. Let me read you a few passages. Isaiah 46, 9. Mark these what I got. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10 says, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and my ancient times, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. Isaiah 14, verses uh, verse 24 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I planned, so shall it be. And as I have purpose, so shall it stand. The God is God. We're not. He is in complete control, and he does as he wills. Now, most people in here wouldn't, wouldn't disagree with that statement. The God is in control, and he does whatever he wants. He's God. We're not. But where we kind of get mixed up in prayer, and I've heard people talk about this before, is, well, if God is sovereign and God's going to do whatever God wants to do, then why should I pray? Like, what, why does Scripture tell me to pray then if, if what you're saying is my prayers are not going to make any kind of difference? And I want to show you this morning from Scripture that actually the sovereignty of God and our prayers are intertwined. That they don't war against each other, that they actually flow in the same direction. And so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Isaiah chapter 36. So we're going to be addressing the question this morning. Last week we addressed the question of, um, does God hear us when we pray? Today we're going to address the question of, why do we pray if God is sovereign? If God is in complete control, why do we need to pray then? Why does scripture over and over and over again, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 simply says pray continually. Like why does the Bible tell us this? It says persist in prayer. Jesus tells us to not lose heart in prayer. So why, why these two concepts? Why these two ideas? I want to look at this morning how these ideas kind of intertwine and they actually go together. So if you've got your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 36 verse 1. It says, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. All right, so let me give you a little background what's going on here. When, king he when Hezekiah was king, he's the king of the southern kingdom called Judah. And before the nation is about to go into exile, the Assyrians are going to assault Jerusalem until the people were left almost utterly hopeless. And where, where this is coming from is before Hezekiah, there was a king named Ahaz. And Ahaz was a very wicked king. And what uh, 2 Chronicles 28 is going to tell us is that he refused to seek the Lord's help. And so this is, the, this is who Judah has been led by, is this very wicked king who refused to seek the Lord's help. And because of this, Assyria is assaulting the southern kingdom of Judah, under King Hezekiah. The Judah is now firmly lodged between a rock and a horrifying enemy. And so my first point this morning, of why, why do we pray if God is sovereign? I got three points. My first point is simply this, is lack of communication leads to separation. 
that lack of communication leads to separation. You know, we often wonder about how we, we say things like, how did our nation get to this point? How, how, how did we get, we look around and we see so many different things going on in our nation that we're like, how did we get here? The verse we quote all the times, uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 tells us that if my people who are called by my name will do what? Will humble themselves and what? And pray. And pray. Because if, we, if lack of communication is happening, then there is separation. I can't tell you how many men that I've talked to who are struggling in their marriage. And I ask you, how, how, or I ask them, how is their, how is their uh, communication with their wife? Well, it's not great. Because lack of communication leads to separation. Why do we pray even though God is sovereign? Because what God wants most from you is a relationship. And every relationship is built upon communication. There's no strong relationship that you have where communication is not the foundation of it. Whether that's your marriage, whether that's your friendship. If you don't have communication with somebody, the relationship suffers. And it's the same thing with God. And when it comes to God, if we don't have communication with God, God doesn't suffer, we do. We do, because we need that. We looked at last week that God is a good, good father. That he wants and he yearns to hear from his children. There's a line from um, any Chronicle of Narnia fans in here by any chance, by C.S. Lewis. Okay, all right, I, Ava, I see you. All right, um... In, in one of uh, C.S. Lewis's books about this, uh, talking about Aslan, uh, says that uh, Lucy, a little girl, she, at one point she says that, um, I think he would have provided the food if we would have asked. And his character, it's a horse, replies, why do we have to, <clears throat> or the horse, sorry, his horse says to Lucy, I think he would have provided the food if we would have asked, to which Lucy replies, why do we have to ask? Aslan knows that we need it. The horse replies back, certainly he does, but I just get the impression that he likes it when we ask. And I love that C.S. Lewis intertwines us and puts us in there because, listen, God loves it when we ask. God loves it when we come to him and talk to him. Just like any good father loves when their children come and communicate with them. I'm at the phase of fatherhood where my children are able to start having conversations. And it's awesome. And I love sitting down and talking with my children. One of the things that <clears throat> we got this nighttime routine with Bishop right now. And one of the things that Bishop wants to do before we go to bed is he just wants to talk. And he wants to tell us about his favorite things and ask us about our favorite things. And so it's been everything from what's your favorite car, what's your favorite football team, what's your favorite color. And so we've just been talking about these things. And listen, I love these sweet moments. Love them, cherish them. Because a good father loves to communicate with his children, and so does God. And listen, <coughs> excuse me. God, hear me when I say, hear me when I say this. God is not too busy for your request. God is not too busy for your request. I saw this thing uh, the other day. It was um, two pastors having a debate kind of over this subject. And one of the pastors framed it in light of, like, the president of the United States, he has so much to do. He has so much going on. He said, you wouldn't walk up to the White House, expect to get in, expect to walk into the Oval Office and present your small request to the president. To which the other pa re pastor replied, yeah, but you can if you're his child. And we can present our requests to God because we're his children. That's why when Jesus teaches us how to pray, what we talked about last week, we pray like this, our Father. We can present and make requests to God because we're his child. That's what God is telling us. And so why do we pray even though God is sovereign? It's because that if we don't, we, lose, we get separated from God. Not eternally, but relationally. We may not lose salvation, but we, we, we lose fellowship over that. And believe me, you need fellowship with God on a day-to-day -day basis. 
I was talking with somebody this week. A very dear friend of mine whose wife was eight months pregnant and went to a doctor's appointment and found out there was no heartbeat and went into emergency labor the next day and baby was born dead. And uh, I'm so ready for Jesus to come back, by the way. Um, I'm ready to never have these conversations again. Praise God, because in heaven there are there's none of this for eternity. But as I sat there and as I talked with my buddy about what what he was going through, he said that he said that my prayer life has never been deeper than it is right now. And he said something that. That's just sticking with me, and I can't, I can't agree more. He said, he said he doesn't understand how people get through life without a relationship with God. And I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know how you do. I don't know how I would. But it's that fellowship with God on a day-to-day basis. We pray even though God is sovereign because it's beneficial to us, because it keeps us in fellowship with our Father. We make our requests known to him no matter how big or small. Luke 12 says that he cares about the birds of the field, the sparrows, that not one falls without him knowing. How much more does he care for us? So the first point of why we pray, even though um, God is sovereign, is because lack of communication leads to separation. Let's look back in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 30, let's skip to verse 37. Hezekiah is going to seek a prophet, and this prophet's name is Isaiah. Hezekiah doesn't want to follow the king's example before him, but he wants to turn to God, and so he goes to the prophet Isaiah. In verse 6, Isaiah said to him, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with me with Uh, with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled you. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. That Hezekiah does what Ahaz didn't. That he turns to God and he prays. And Isaiah tells him that this is what God has said. That, That this king's going to hear a rumor, he's going to turn around, he's going to go back to his own land, and he's going to die. And you won't even be attacked. Second point is this, why do we pray even though God is sovereign? It's because God responds to the prayers of his people. It's because God responds to the prayers of his people. Hezekiah prays and God responds. We see this all throughout scripture. See this at the parting of the Red Sea. We see this in Joshua chapter 10 where he prays for the sun to stand still. We see this in Jonah chapter 2 where Jonah cries out from God in the belly of a whale. The Jonah responds to the, or Jonah, God responds to the prayers of his people. And God promises Hezekiah that they're going to have victory. I have not met, and I've met several of them. We have one sitting right down here, Miss Jill. Some of the biggest prayer warriors I've ever met in my life. I'll tell you something that is true about every prayer warrior, every person I've met that is dedicated to prayer, who is going to pray, who is not going to give the simple excuse or simple request, or I'll pray for you, but they actually mean it. I'll tell you something that is true about their lives is that they cling to the promises of God is that their prayer life is born out of the promises that God gives us. And God gives his promise to Hezekiah, and his promise does not cause Hezekiah to relax or to pray less, but gives him confidence and urgency before the throne. That he clings to what God has promised here, that they will have victory. That God responds to the prayers of his people. You may be sitting here today and say, well, 
I've cried out to God and he hasn't answered. Let me say this. Un, there's a difference between unanswered prayers and unheard prayers. And hear me when I say that with God, unanswered prayers are not, are, are not unheard prayers. That just because God has an answer does not mean he does not hear you. I don't know how many of y'all are active on Twitter. Miss Harriet, probably. No. Uh, then who am I following? No, uh, but uh, Steve Harvey this morning, uh, I happened to just stumble, I was on Twitter, I happened to stumble across one of his tweets, and he simply said that, wait until you see why God asked you to wait. Wait until you see why God asked you to wait. I don't know much about, I, I, I've seen, you know, Family Feud and those kind of things, and uh, I like Steve Harvey's personality. I don't know much about his faith walk, but I was like, man, that will preach. I started thinking about that. And I think there's going to be a lot, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of things that we say in heaven. There's going to be a lot of praises on our lips. There's going to be a lot of rejoicing on our lips. But I think one of the most uttered phrases that we're going to say in heaven is, oh, like, oh, that's what you were doing. Oh, I get it now. Oh, that's why that happened. That we're going to see why God does the things that he does, why God responds the way that he responds. And it's going to make sense to us. So often we have this view, and I've heard it put like this, that we have this view uh, of this giant puzzle that is coming together, and all we can see is one little piece. All we can see is a piece in front of us. And we're looking at this piece and saying, I don't get it. This doesn't look good. This doesn't make sense. But God sees the entire picture, and he is the one putting it together. And he is making something beautiful out of it. So God responds to the prayers of his people. Here's a little phrase, in his time. In his time. God responds to the prayers of his people in his time. And that is hard for us because we are very impatient. And I say we because I'm leading that charge. I struggle with patience. You ever heard somebody say, don't pray for patience? Apparently I did at some point, right? Uh, man, dumb. But God responds to the prayers of his people. And just because he hasn't answered you does not mean he does not hear you or he's not going to respond. So why do we, why do we pray to God even though he is sovereign? It's because God responds to the prayers of his people. And here's the third thing. Let's, let's finish this story almost. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 37. Let's go down to verse 15. This is Hezekiah, he's going to pray to God again. Again, he's doing what Ahaz, the leader before him, did not. He's crying out to God. We get a first-hand view of his prayer through the prophet Isaiah, and he says in verse 15, And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you are, are you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, hear and open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods but the work of men's hands and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. Verse 20. So now, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. I love this prayer of Hezekiah. My third point this morning is that God accomplishes his purposes through our prayers. Is that God accomplishes his purposes through our prayers. Hezekiah, knowing what God had promised him, that they were going to have victory, prayed for it to happen. And this is what we do. So we cling to what God has promised us. Romans chapter 8, two, two, two ones that I always stick with are, are in Romans, it, in Romans chapter 8, it tells us 
that God works all things for good for those who love him. In Ecclesiastes, we just read that uh, a few, few weeks ago, that God makes everything beautiful in its time. And if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, what I've got is not good, what I've got is not beautiful, then hear me, God is not done. God is not done. And these are the things that I cling to. That God, I don't understand, but I know that you're going to make this good. Help me see. That God, I know that this is going to be beautiful in this time. It's hard for me to understand, but help me see what you're doing in the midst of this. We don't pray. Our goal in prayer is to not change the will of God, but to bring it about. We don't pray to change God's will. It's not going to happen. But we pray to bring it about. That God's will will be done whether we pray or not, that's true. But God's will will not be done without prayer because God has ordained it to make prayers indispensable. That God accomplishes his will, his purposes through our prayers. That's why when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he says that we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. This is what we pray. And Hezekiah prays this to God based on his promises. Sure enough, God is going to send, send a crib back to his own land. Here's a rumor just like God has promises, promised, and his son is actually going to kill him and take him out without even entering into the kingdom. God keeps his promise because God accomplishes his purposes through our prayers. Something I desperately long to hear. In fact, it, 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 there's not even close. What I long to hear more than anything else is well done, good and faithful servant. That is what I long to hear above anything else. Living for that day. But there's something else that I, I would love to hear from God. And it's found in, in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 21. It says, um, Then Isaiah the son of Amaz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Israel, this is what the Lord has spoken concerning him. He's going to tell us that he is going to fall. But there's a phrase in here, I don't know if you caught it, but it's something I long to hear. And it's the phrase, because you prayed to me. Because you prayed to me. Listen, if you're in here and your prayer life is lacking you're missing out on a lot of blessings from God. Because you prayed to me. I would love to hear God tell me, because you prayed to me. That family member, I saved them. I brought salvation to them. Because you prayed to me. I brought healing to somebody's life. Because you prayed to me. We pray because God accomplishes his purposes through our prayers. We don't give up in praying. Your prayers have a purpose and they're powerful. Do not ever think that your prayers are unheard or meaningless. They're not. So we persist in prayer. We approach God because lack of communication leads to separation. We pray to God even though he's sovereign because we need it. We need to be close to our Father. We pray to God because God responds to the prayers of his people. No matter how big or small, God responds to the prayers of his people. And lastly, we pray to God even though he's sovereign because God accomplishes his purposes through our prayers. And how great a day it will be in heaven. To look around and say, oh, that's what you were doing. But to hear God say, because you prayed, 
this happened, because you prayed that happened, because you prayed I did this. This is how I accomplished my will. Listen, so many of us rejoiced and when the abortion thing came out. Why? Because we have prayed. We have prayed for that. I want to ask you this morning, like, what do you have in your life? This is what I want to end with, with this prayer series. What do you have in your life that the only way it's going to happen is that God is going to do it? Is it the salvation of a family member? Is it the healing of somebody? Is it to see revival break out at at Grosbeck High School in Thornton, Texas? Is it to see our nation turn back to God? Like, what do, you have, what do you have in your life that the only thing that's going to happen is because God did it? Christians, I'm asking you. You're not being unheard. Keep praying. Keep crying out to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for all the ways that you love us, all the ways that you bless us, Lord. God, how sweet a day it will be to hear because you prayed. God, you move powerfully through the prayers of your people to accomplish your purposes, your will. Father, I pray for anybody in here that would claim that they're a Christian but feel distant from you. Father, may they start simply today by crying out to you because lack of communication leads to separation. Father, I pray that we would never think that our prayers are unheard, but that we would realize you that you respond to the prayers of your people. God, may we think of those things that the only way they're going to happen is if you do it. God, I would love to see things happen across our town, across our our school districts, across our country, across our world, Lord. That we would look and we say, the only way that happened is God did it. Father, I pray that we would be people crying out to you to do things only you could do. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.